Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to ISEN 630. Uh, this is the fourth uh, major topic uh, on displays. Okay, so first, we want to define what we're talking about. What does it mean to, what is a display? Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, I'm, everybody knows an example of a display. Um, you're looking at one right now. Um, you are hearing one right now. Um, you know, uh, uh, so it's, it's basically, uh, uh, the key thing is to not only think about things that are visual, but any synthetic item, any non internal information source, basically, uh, anything designed to communicate, uh, system variables to a human. Okay. There's an example we are familiar with, um, but a static sign. Uh, this is a display. It, it's not a dynamic display, uh, you know, like this, but it's a display. Um, you know, we maybe have uh, uh, mechanical elements in our displays. Um, you know, so if you can imagine, these dials are are driven by you know mechanical um, uh, underpinnings. Um, could be a purely auditory display. Could be a purely Tactile, vibrotactile, you know, using the sense of touch might be how we receive a message. Um, I even have an example here of an olfactory display. So these do exist um, and you can use them, you know, to present certain scents. If a, a scent is used to convey some important information somehow, well, it doesn't even have to be important, just some information related to something. All right. Now, when you add... Uh, controls, and this is going to be topic five. So we're on topic four right now. Uh, topic five involves controls. That's when we have an interface. Um, so we're, we're talking, you know, in general about uh, humans interacting with technologies, with other things. Human systems interaction is the, you know, is, is another way to characterize this course. Um, and that inter requires a give and take. And so we're going to talk about both in this uh, topic, how humans receive information from a system through displays. And then the next topic is how they convey information to a system, or how do they, you know, send a message back to it or, or, um, or, or um, communicate their intent through the control items of that, uh, you know, of that system. All right, so there we go. Okay, so for the first subtopic, uh, we're going to define a, a few key terms, concepts, um, dichotomies, distinctions um, that have to do with, well, different types of displays and different ways that humans will uh, process uh, data from those displays. So here we go. Okay, so the first distinction we want to make is whether the display is giving data to a human and allowing them basically, you know, do what you will with these data, um, status display, or is it more of a command display, uh, which is, hey, human, do this. Okay, so I've got an example of each here. Um, as long as you, I, I'm assuming you would uh, view this display here as the status of, you know, how much fuel you currently have. Um, then a human may make their own decisions and be able to say, okay, I've got, here's the current status of my fuel level. I can decide whether or not I need to fill it up um, versus the red light. This is not telling you the state of traffic. It's telling you human stop. It's your turn to stop. Uh, so the logic is, you know, not necessarily revealed to the human. Uh, and in this case, there is, uh, you know, um, basically leaving the decision making to the human. It's just providing here's the state of the system. Okay. So we look at these because they have different properties with, uh, with how humans, uh, you know, can make use of them when they, when they work, when they don't so, so well. So I've got two examples of, I could essentially have the same underlying sensor data in some, you know, autonomous system. And then I can have the logic there to either say, you know, you're, you, if I'm driving in my car and I have a, I have my own, like, uh, you know, um, third party, uh, 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 
uh, a speed sensor I'm testing. And so I could, you know, I could have it tell me, oh, your speed is currently too high. I'd call that a status display. Okay, come on, give it to me. There it is. Uh, so that's, that's the status of the system. Uh, I'm keeping the human informed, but I'm keeping them as the authority. I'm keeping them as the, as the one uh, who is ultimately responsible for, um, you know, wh what happens in the system here. Um, uh, this is nice when there is a system that allows, you know, humans the luxury to think and to make decisions based on uh, what's hopefully, uh, uh, you know, valid information. Um, but in general, this allows a human to take all of their context into account. So if I need to know, okay, your, your speed is too high, I could say, all right, that's good. I should try to slow down. But currently right now, you know, for whatever reason, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm trying to pass another car, for example. Um, so the context is, okay, it's higher than the speed limit, maybe it's higher than I want to be traveling long term. But for this temporary situation, it makes sense for me to do this. All right, contrast with a command display, which might just tell me, sorry, having trouble here, uh, which might just tell me what I should do. It relieves the human of the burden of decision making, of collecting data, of making a good decision. Uh, it basically just allows that decision to be made by the, uh, you know, the automated intelligence. Um, that could be good if the human doesn't have, they're not in a good place to make a, you know, well-reasoned, timed out, you know, like a thoughtful decision. You know, for example, do I go or stop as I'm approaching this intersection, you know, and I'm less than a second from that intersection. Uh, so then it's nice to have you know, the strengths of, um, of automation, you know, which could be something like how fast a machine can calculate, you know, uh, uh, things relative to, a, to the human brain. Um, and so if we have something that is very reliable and we as humans know it has reliable logic and it tells us to do something, um, this is what we call a command display. It's commanding me to do something. It's not telling me, um, you know, the reasoning behind its command, I just have to assume that it's, you know, it's good. And I save time, you know, and I save effort. But it costs me the ability to say, well, what about this one context where I'm trying to, you know, pass this car? Uh, couldn't you couldn't you let me make my own decision in that context? So there's pros and cons with each of them, right? And, uh, and actually, the design sort of suggestion here is have aspects of both of them. So the benefits of a status display are you can allow humans to have a little more decision, you know, sort of um, a, a, a more informed role in the decision process, take additional factors, you know, additional like unusual contexts into account. Um, but you could also give that human, you know, some clear direction and say, we you know, we are sorry, the, the, the automated system thinks you should lower your speed, because here's the status that, that tells us why it's currently too high. Uh, and a good example of this is um, the traffic collision avoidance system TCAS in, you know, in, uh, you know, modern day commercial aircraft, they will tell not only, um, you know, give a command about how to maneuver around a potential collision here in space, you know, or in the airspace. Um, but it will also give the status of everybody around you. So you can kind of be making, you know, informed decisions before you get to a point where commands become necessary. So if you have a little bit of both, right, the status and the command aspect uh, can be really beneficial. Okay. All right, next major distinction that we will make are um, whether we are processing things uh, or, or symbolic elements, if we're using uh, more of our semantic symbolic processing, decoding, so to speak, or if we're more experiencing something with a different perspective uh, through pictorial elements. So symbolic versus pictorial elements and symbolic versus pictorial processing. I'm going to I'm basically saying what, you know, what's in the display and how does the human use it towards, you know, understanding the message here. All right. So starting at the top, <clears throat> symbolic elements, um, 
you know, believe it or not, each word I utter, each bleh, each sound that comes out of my mouth is symbolically encoded. Uh, uh, words, languages are essentially arbitrary utterances that have been given meaning, and that's a meaning that we have to learn. And so we call this symbolic processing. Um, you know, the alphabet here, which we can look at and and understand immediately, but at one point in our lives, we had to understand what this shape meant fundamentally and what groups of these different shapes mean in terms of their encoded meaning, okay? So that encoding and decoding aspect is symbolic processing. So we have some elements of a display that have a big, high, deep meaning encoded in them, and we have to have understood that code in order to extract the message from it. If we don't speak English or if we don't recognize these characters, for example, if we don't recognize these characters at all, if we're, if we are, you know, um, you know, these are, um, these are not recognized everywhere in the world, right? Um, and so this would be then, uh, you couldn't process them symbolically in that case. Basically, you need to understand the, uh, the relationship with the, uh, you know, with the encoded message. All right. So I also wanted to point out, you know, it's non like it is alphanumerics. Those are symbolic elements of a display. But also we have these, you know, iconic imagery um, and the idea of peace and everything it in, you know, involving uh, uh, this concept of peace. It's a bigger thing than just what this image gives us is kind of my point. Um, and then similarly, we don't, it's not only in, you know, font or, 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 or you know, emoji type uh, symbols. These can be hand gestures. They can be things, you know, that are done, um, you know, without a technological medium necessarily. Um, all right, good. So pictorial elements, in, in contrast, uh, don't require any encoding or decoding. Uh, so think about things like, what is my human population uh, that needs to receive this message? And if your job is to make the signage for here's how you get out of this public building if there's a fire, uh, you have to account for every human in there, whether or not they speak English, whether or not they can read, whether or not they can see, right? Um, and well, I guess that last one doesn't help me here in this example. But, but what, what you need to think about is the experience of needing to get out of a building you're unfamiliar with. And one of the best ways to uh, guide a human in that experience that's independent of any ability to you know, encode or decode a message or, you know, languages are to use these spatial aspects. So pictorial elements, a map is the best example here. Um, so pictorial elements, you can think of them as pictures. Um, but the key thing is that you're experiencing and not decoding something. Okay. I know there's a, you have to think about that a little bit, you know, you have to take a minute and think about that. Um, but I can experience the fact that this room is across a hallway from this room. And I'm not needing to decode any language to do that, okay? Um, I could also then look at, okay, well, green here and then this, you know, these scribblies here, what I can't see them right now, but whatever those say, those have a symbolic aspect to them but I'm, I'm more experiencing the spatial relationship among these different rooms uh, and I would decode other symbolic elements of it. So I could have a little bit of both. Uh, I mean, I always do, right? Uh, with any sort of display, I've got symbolic elements that are processed, you know, in terms of the decoding aspect and pictorial elements, which are more experienced and sort of uh, give you a different perspective of, of the system. All right. Yep. So again, just kind of reinforcing that. So here's a great example, you know, a zoo, uh, a zoo map, right? Now, this is something that, you know, you might have printed on a, you know, uh, uh, you know, in a display space at the zoo. This could be something that tens of thousands of people, you know, need to gain information from uh, people of all, you know, all, all different walks of life. They can read, they can't, they're, you know, they're all ages, et cetera. So you've got to give somebody enough information to work with, you know, the, uh, both uh, the experience of where am I relative to other things of interest? And then 
I can, you know, I can experience that by the spatial relationships. And then the symbolic elements are going to give me more information, but I have to be able to decode them. I have to understand a language in order to be able to make sense of the words here. But I don't need to speak English to make use of, I see spatial relationships here. Uh, and then let me just point out some of the symbology here is not dependent on any one language. So there's a good reason to use icons like this that have understandable meanings that are not necessarily dependent on a language. All right, so uh, again, the key point here is symbolic elements and pictorial elements and how they contribute to uh, you know, having a useful uh, uh, data source for, for humans in whatever their task might be, whether that's find the lions or, you know, um, or, or, or start up my, my nuclear power plant, you know, or, or whatever, whatever the display or, or, or visual information source might be. Okay. So now with that distinction, we're going to start with, um, you know, symbolic displays. Uh, again, this is, we have to have in, encoded, we have to have an understanding of what these symbols mean, uh, whether those symbols are you know, alphanumeric characters in a language or they're an otherwise, you know, well understood cultural sort of uh, uh, item like an arrow. This is something that we at some point we had to learn what an arrow means, right? It is a collection of lines in a cool shape. Um, but to understand that this denotes direction or it denotes something moving, um, that that took a decoding that took a symbolic processing right okay um, we might also have you know I uh, um, logos for example have a much bigger idea behind them um, you know we could have you know non nonverbal but pictorial aspects but the idea here is that we are trying to communicate a, a message in an encoding thing here so this isn't about experiencing a cow hitting a a, a car it's about recognizing that cow and car are, 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 are encoded data icons. And so then I am interpreting that, hey, I guess I might hit a, I might hit a car if I'm, well, yeah, I might hit a car if I'm a cow. <laughs> uh, so I have to be aware of that, right? So I have to put that together. I have to decode these, these images. Uh, I may have also dynamic. So these are, you know, static ones. They don't change. Think of, you know, road signage, for example. But then anything that may have more than one state uh, that's clearly displayed, more than one, so two, I guess, is more than one. Uh, but in these cases, note that once that sign is up, it is always the same message whenever it is received. Uh, any of these may have more than one state. And I want to point out that even one state could be um, railroad or uh, train crossing versus not train crossing that can be two states that are communicated by this display so the lights off are one state the lights on are a second state that's that's a dynamic display because we have two different possible states of that display uh yeah similarly you know traffic lights even wow this is weird a sundial it changes through the course of the day there's no mechanical elements in it at all right but this is a display it is a visual information source that's used towards some human task like trying to tell time or trying to see how cool it is or something um right so yeah it, it, if if there's any changing aspect to the display it's a dynamic uh display there we go all right now whether these displays are static or dynamic uh, we may, uh, especially when we're talking about reading um, things towards some task, we're usually talking about things, you know, in this class, like how much gas do I have to be able to complete this task or how, how soon do, like I, I'm saying uh, 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 things where, where numbers are involved, you know, time, these are aspects of, you know, of interest here for, for this course. Um, so let's talk about two ways, you know, in general, humans might look at a number um, or, or I guess any alphanumeric, but included in there are some numbers. So the first could be, I'm interested in how much of something I'm doing some sort of comparison. Okay, I need to know, um, do I have enough? Do I not have enough? Do I have more? Does that 
team have more points than that team? You know, do I have more than zero or, you know, yeah, do I have more than a minute left in the current game, for example? Um, so any of these that have to do with how muchness, right? Or any sort of mathematical comparison, uh, we call it a quantitative reading. Okay, so we have to engage our working memory a little bit. We have to think mental maths uh, in this mode, okay? Uh, another way that I could read those symbols is more qualitative, okay? So I'm not needing to do much um, uh, 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 mental math. I'm not really engaging my working memory to that extent, um, but I might be doing a really quick, I wonder if it's this and confirm yes or no. Okay, I wonder if my team has the ball, yes or no. Uh, and so yes or no is not a mathematical question. You know, in, in general, we can say the quality of we have the ball, they have the ball. Um, or is it the third quarter or, you know, and actually I know there are numbers here, first quarter, second, third, and fourth, but maybe I would think about that qualitatively. Like, is it the, you know, is it the fourth quarter? Because I know that that means it's when the whole game is on the line not that I, I'm thinking of it as being the one after the third quarter. I'm not as interested in where it stands. It's the one where it, you know, it matters. The whole game is about to end, right? So, so if you think about the quality, if you're doing a information seeking task towards judging some quality, it's a qualitative reading. It tends to be characterized in a certain way. And if we are, no, I need to extract uh, uh, data in order to make comparisons, um, then it's quantitative. So this matters for how those data would be displayed. And I'll just give one quick example. Um, if I had, if I needed to know what exactly is the score right now, you would call that maybe a little bit more of a qualitative reading, you know? Um, and I can see the digits telling me one and four, two and eight, and I can interpret those and I can say, okay, it's a 14 to 28 game. That is the quality of this game. But if I was saying who's winning and by how much, maybe, and this is just a crazy idea, but I'm just suggest this. If instead of these digital numerical uh, values here, if instead we had some sort of bar graph and it was mapping the points of each team, then visually, you could very, very quickly, essentially experience which team is, is, is winning just by looking at something and saying that's a longer line than that one. And so I'm removing the need for a whole bunch of mental math. Um, and it all has to do with, well, how am I taking these same data, like what the score in this game is, and how am I displaying this to a human? Um, and there isn't one answer for what is the way I should do it? It's what are all the different ways that a human may try to, or may want to extract data from this display. And therefore, are they going to be, you know, doing a quantitative or qualitative readings? There are different ways, you know, that, that, that display elements are more accommodating of, of, of one type of processing over another. All right. Okay, good. So symbolic displays, uh, a couple of examples. Uh, you know, when you go to like the history of, you know, um, uh, mechanical elements uh, and everything. So uh, we, direct reading or direct view, I see what the data are. They are right, you know, it's, it's the most basic type. Um, yes, these are encoded in alphanumerics, but I don't have to compare one thing to an indicator and then try to do the math at all. I am just interpreting uh, straight there. Uh, or I may have a scale indicator. So direct reading just tells me the, the data. It might in, in, in a digital format. Scale indicators, um, you know, and a lot of times these are because they're mechanical um, sorts of systems. So they, you know, they, they're sort of limited in how they most effectively can display what's mechanically encoded. Um, and so in this case, uh, there are a lot of different scale and um, scale models. And so I want to make the distinction between the scale and the indicator. And so the indicator is gonna be the, the needle here. And we can either have the needle move or the scale move or both, okay? And so there are different types of, uh, of gauges, scales, um, you know, that have different, you know, 
um, reasons to do that, basically. So examples, okay, we can have, uh, so this is a good example of a display that is typically used for quantitative readings, how much, you know, uh, and I have a fixed scale, you know, so this is, you know, with a speedometer here, the background doesn't move, I can point at the number 80, and it will never move uh, as long as, you know, from where I'm pointing with my finger, but the index will indicate along that scale uh, of what my quantitative value is. Um, similarly, I could have a fixed scale, the background doesn't move, and the index does move, but I could be using this for more of a qualitative process, like, do I have enough oil and it's in the white or not, and it's in the red. Is it white or red is more of a qualitative sort of processing. Um, so if I was doing a check, like, am I okay to keep driving right now or keep mowing this lawn? Um, I could just look and see, am I in the red or not? Not necessarily where I am in a quantitative sense. Okay. Uh, and then quantitative and qualitative, we can then say, let's have the index stay put and let's move the scale uh, behind it. So if you think of a compass, this is actually, uh, you know, I know you can wiggle it and everything, but if it's magnetically aligned with the poles, the index doesn't move, I guess, with respect to that alignment. Uh, and so you tend to, you move the scale uh, while the index stays oriented towards true north, right? Um, so, and then this is, I could call this quantitative if I was saying, how much more do I need to turn to go due east? That's how much. I could also look at this compass and say, which cardinal direction am I currently going? That's more of a qualitative processing. But let's, you know, let's say I'm, let's say I'm doing how much more. So, so it's a quantitative processing. That's, that's why I labeled it that way. Uh, fixed index moving scale, qualitative. Uh, you know, in this case, you know, did I win or not? Did I get a match or not? That's not moreness or lessness. It's uh, it's cherryness, <laughs> cherryness or or other fruit, right? All right. Okay, okay, okay. All right. So that's uh, wraps up uh, symbolic displays, symbolic processing, uh, and so now pictorial elements. So now this is instead of decoding something, uh, instead of having to know the meaning behind these symbols. Uh, pictorial displays are, you know, at least pictorial elements in displays are designed to help uh, the human experience a different perspective or, or experience the message with like minimal cognitive steps, basically. So if I can imagine I'm a flying aircraft hurtling through the atmosphere um, and I don't have to keep thinking, okay, well, how do I interpret all these lines here? If I just naturally sort of interpret this as I'm experiencing flying like this, that's what's going on here with this aircraft attitude display. Um, this shape here is designed to sort of um, emulate the, the shape of the aircraft here. So it's supposed to sort of look like, you know, the blue is uh, above the horizon and the, and the dark is below the horizon. It's supposed to be like, how am I doing relative to the horizon, the experience? Um, so there's not a whole lot of decoding here. It's, it's more um, imagine that, you know, imagine this perspective and you can kind of tap into it and have this awareness of the attitude of the aircraft uh, as you go. All right. Um, virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, a lot of these are essentially giving you a new experience that you didn't otherwise naturally have. Uh, so you can see they're, you know, generating, this is what this office uh, furniture would look like in this space, um, gives you a perspective through this display element uh, that you wouldn't otherwise normally have. Uh, this is an example of augmented reality. So we can be walking, you know, down the street and see, uh, you know, uh, I've used these when I've, you know, been in, uh, in different cities for conferences and things, where do I go for various things? Um, and then, of course, uh, maybe maybe this is a dated reference now, but Pokemon Go and whatever the next big thing is, which gets people, you know, exploring the real environment and then superimposing game elements into that. This is artificial aspects into what is apparently real augmented reality. Okay, so augmented reality is we we use elements of the real world 
and we add to it. Virtual reality is usually in the, that's in the closed space. Okay, so, you know, here we go. So virtual reality again is I am entirely um, generating the visuals. I, I should say, yeah, I'm entirely in a, in a closed system. Augmented reality is meant to add to the experience of physical reality. So uh, this is a good example uh, of like a firefighter who might be in a real, you know, burning building and might get this projection uh, display uh, which is not really physically in the world, but is apparently so because it, because of the face mask we can project onto it and can get this apparent imagery uh, that's towards whatever task he's doing, which I assume is related to, you know, dealing with the burning building. Uh, but good example, augmented reality, adding on top of what you're currently uh, experiencing. Uh, so virtual reality, um, you know, these are no longer like impressive futuristic images. These are almost commonplace now. We can actually get, you know, uh, uh, in 2022, it is not uh, more than a couple hundred dollars to get a virtual reality headset with the processing power um, that could allow us to, you know, explore at high resolution inside a 3D model of, you know, human body or, or of course, any other complex 3D imagery. Um, and this is really important because before the ability to do that, you know, it wasn't only, you know, it was within my lifetime that, you know, a textbook, an anatomy textbook and real cadavers were about as good as it got, you know, for medical training. And every generation needs new people who know what the inside of a human looks like in order to keep that healthy. Uh, and so this is an incredible tool if you can imagine you know, I'm studying, you know, the whatever gland, uh, and I don't have to go and get another, you know, cadaver or, or try to interpret this from a textbook and imagine what that might look like gives a much more closer to the real experience sort of, uh, uh, you know, exploratory space. So otherwise inaccessible views, we could also talk about dangerous sorts of activities. Oops. Uh, and so, you know, virtual reality is great for training things like, like military operations where you don't get good at, you know, being a military, you know, operator, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, very well without practicing it. Uh, and so this gives people, you know, a chance to drill on some of their skills without actually being put in, you know, harm's way in, in a dangerous situation. Um, of course, there's always the question of, well, how well does this translate to the real environment? There's actually a pretty nice, you know, human factor science around that. So if you want to look into the HFES technical group on training, uh, those sorts of questions are addressed in, in that subfield. Um, oh, yeah. Also, hey, how about uh, what does it feel like when there is a tumor, a bone tumor? Okay. Um, well, you either find a whole bunch of cancerous bones or people who are, you know, cadavers or, or, or people with these conditions, or you figure out, hey, we, can we simulate this? Can we make a virtual reality trainer? And so, you know, this is a, a surgeon or like think of a dentist, right? Um, to be able to feel, you know, the haptic, uh, the force feedback that you need to be able to understand Here's how I would do this procedure. Here's how I would, you know, feel feel what it feels like to 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 be pushing on a cavity without having to, you know, uh, uh, find ten thousand cavities and feel them all. So you get that level of experience. If you can simulate it, we can get close to that actual experience. All right, there we go. Uh, okay, so um, within the realm of augmented reality displays, there's a special case of them we call head up displays. The, the key with these are we, so typically they're in these like high tempo sorts of controlled um, um, cockpits, so to speak. These are all vehicles. Uh, but you can imagine I'm doing a human task that is fast paced, that is risky, that is, you know, uh, safety critical. Um, and what this allows me to do is give me task related data uh, in a way that minimizes my need to visually look away and search for it. So in all of these cases, the assumption is the eyes 
should be focused on the most important visual data, which are outside of the vehicle. Anybody who flies an aircraft, you, you, you say, well, out, out of the windscreen that through there, that's the most important, you know, display. Similarly, I'd say that for driving a car. Um, now we have other data that we need to consider. And if we have to be look shifting our, our field of view back and forth, this can be costly because uh, I'm looking away from the road. And so the idea with a head up display is the head never needs to go down to seek that more information. That's why head up. Um, and so what I'm seeing here are projected uh, uh, versions of the same displayed data in a way that allows me to not change my field of view in order to sample them. So head up, right, there you go. Advantages here, um, I can better, you know, I can monitor my surroundings. I'm not looking away from the road. Uh, uh, a key here is that we don't want, if I'm looking out, um, you know, at my environment and I've got this other projected imagery within my same field of view, think about the need to focus on a near plane or a far plane and how that focus might mess with your ability to see what's going on here. Uh, so typically the way that um, that's avoided is the focal point for the generated imagery will be at apparently at optical infinity. So they call this uh, collimation. So we collimate the imagery at optical infinity. Uh, and that matters so that I'm not, if I'm looking out at the horizon, you know, which is typically about as where I'm looking, if I'm driving or flying an aircraft, um, I'm not changing my plane of view back and forth, which would be a major cause of visual fatigue. So why does it matter if you've ever, you know, tried to use any, um, you know, superimposed uh, uh, augmented imagery like this uh, in head up displays, and these are not, you know, at the focal point of the distance, then you're going to have some major uh, back and forth, uh, either, either um, you're going to miss things and or you're going to have uh, visual fatigue. Another cost here, you know, if you're, you're cluttering potentially my visual, uh, my, my visual display space, uh, even obvious things can be missed. And there are example studies, um, and, and I'll, I'll make sure that I can uh, find this article and I'll post it on Canvas, um, where um, pilots would be training. I know this was 1991, so it was a long time ago, but training with these head-up display elements, and uh, they would be fortunately in a simulator, but a very realistic simulator and coming in and landing, uh, on, you know, coming in for a landing and not realizing that there was another aircraft on the runway and they come down right on top of them because they're distracted by the head up display generated elements. Um, so that's a pretty, uh, important wait a minute, um, you know, sort of counter example, uh, that makes us, you know, be careful about the way these are designed just because you're looking or your eyes are pointed towards something doesn't mean it's seen. And this is a good example of how, you know, humans can miss things. All right, that is the end of the first subsection for topic four.